Welcome to the Mirror Talks podcast, where we deconstruct some of humanity's most disconnecting and limiting assumptions and offer an alternative, a free state of consciousness, unbiased, naturally wise, and genuinely loving. We will shed a more enlightened perspective on everyday experiences to help anyone willing realize their true potential and inspire a contemporary spiritual life lift in service to all. Say goodbye to the man-made paradigms of distorted ideas. Let's become pure, free, and actually intelligent once again. We just finished recording an episode on deep suffering or deeply afflictive states, whether it's depression, chronic depression, or sort of more of a daily um, happening, jealousy, or being upset about something, and it just sort of takes over your mood, and just how to deal with these states and and really how to transmute them and take advantage of them. So um, one thing I just loved about this episode, and that I think you'll love too, is that in addition to being very technically precise, um, Bentinho outlines three methods for really, um, really transmuting these deeply afflictive states. So in addition to being really technical in that way, it's also a meditation of its own. So I was even thinking as we were recording this episode, I was thinking like, if I'm in another deeply afflictive state in the future, I'm going to remember this episode and I'm going to come back to it just for a reminder. It's like, uh, it's just like piercing the bubble of that, um, of whatever suffering might come up. So really this is a resource in and of itself. Um, in addition to that, there was a really special, cool ending. Um, Dennis asked a question about social anxiety, which, um, prompted Bentinho to go into just the coolest delineation of how the ego is, uh, hiding from us and really how that, that, um, mechanism, is what causes the the suffering in the deeply afflictive states. So it basically comes at it from a whole nother angle. So it was a wonderful episode, really a, a resource forever, I think. And I know you'll enjoy it. So welcome back everyone to another episode of Mirror Talks. Again, here with me, Kelly and Corey. How are you guys? Great. Good. Awesome. How are you? Really good. Nice. Actually, really good. Yeah. So as we're wrapping up the shooting, the recording of our first season of this podcast, uh, we were feeling into what other episodes to still shoot. And one that stood out pretty evidently is to give people some tools and some perhaps reassurance and some sort of a compassionate understanding space where they get some acknowledgement for the phenomenon of experiencing deeply afflictive states of mind, states of emotion, and so forth. So what's an afflictive state? An afflic affliction or afflictive literally means something that's causing pain or suffering. So deeply def afflictive states are states that um, just feel like impossible to escape. Uh, they have debilitating effects on our mental, emotional, physical well-being. They can even lead to physical illness. Um, it's something that sort of can haunt us uh, along the lines of PTSD. It's something that makes us feel like um, we don't want to get out of bed in the morning. It derails our sort of sense of purpose and our sense of um, uh, flow during the day. And so these states are quite common in humanity. And I think everyone who is human will mm -hmm. at one point or another experience something like that. Mm -hmm. So we figured we have addressed the mechanics of the emotional guidance system already. But this is kind of a beast on its own, like how to deal with deep suffering, with intense suffering, with debilitating suffering, with deeply afflictive states. So that's the intention for this session. Awesome. <clears throat> if you guys have any prompting question, feel free. Um, all right, well, I know a bunch of people who spend a lot of their time, most of their life in a deeply afflictive state, um, you know, like chronic depression or, or whatever it is, some sort of addiction. Um, so I think it is, it is really quite common. And I wonder, 
like for people who who this makes up their norm this is their mm -hmm. normal life their daily background yeah. noise right how do you break through to someone like that how do you break through a cycle like that if you're that person right? yeah yeah so i think i want to refer back to sort of a core structure that people can fall back on and that is i'm quoting the law of one that the path is consists of three steps step one is know yourself know thyself in other words understand yourself and this sentence know thyself in this context it doesn't mean know yourself as the absolute infinite reality know yourself as god in this case know yourself means know what's happening within you know what's going on in front of your consciousness know what's going on on the screen of your experience the screen of your life what's happening within you why are you having um, first of all recognize and acknowledge the thoughts and emotions that arise like recognize them acknowledge them as opposed to ignoring them or being in denial right yeah which would be not knowing them Got it. right so know yourself is a process of acknowledgement of observation of becoming familiar also with your own patterns and recognizing the patterns in your emotional responses to things recognizing the patterns in your thinking and so forth so a full-bodied knowledge of oneself is ideal to know yourself as clearly as you can this is how i typically react in these types of circumstances this is the bias that i have this is the belief that i have these are the preferences that i have and when this kind of thing happens this is how i emotionally respond this is how i respond in terms of action this is what i'm thinking this is how i'm feeling this is when i feel victimized this is when i feel arrogant and so forth just all of it included ideally the holistic being the holistic seeker knows themselves fully knows themselves on all levels as much as possible there are other priorities than knowing yourself in every detail on all levels because that could be the study of a million lifetimes right so we got to take that with a grain of salt at some point but the basis is there the basic instruction is know yourself understand yourself step two is accept yourself so now that you know yourself now that you see your patterns now that you have observed your pain and you kind of begin to understand it or maybe even fully understand it now it's time to accept slash forgive slash release slash let go of that which you know to just let it be as it is to not interfere to not blame to not judge to not hold on to not constrict and so on so again, step one, know yourself. Step two, accept that which you now know about yourself, accept yourself. And then, and for the most part, almost only then does the third step open up, at least in a holistic, integrated manner. You could try to skip to step three, and some people do, but very few do so successfully. And so I don't recommend it. On the whole, periodically, one can do it, but on the whole, it's important to understand yourself and to accept yourself to in incorporate that. And at step three, that opens up once we know ourselves and once we accept ourselves. And once therefore, we're in a sort of a state of peace with ourselves and equilibrium and acceptance. So once we know ourselves, and once we've accepted that which we've now discovered about ourselves, the third step opens up and that is, at least in love one, they stated as become the creator. And this is really the step where spirituality in its truest form begins. The first step are the first two steps are prerequisites. And that's what we're mostly going to talk about today is like how to accept that, how to attain that self knowledge on a relative level, knowing my relative self and accepting my relative self. And relative self simply means anything that moves and changes and has shape and form and dimension and emotional charge and belief systems and so forth. Those things are all relative, they're all contextual. They all exist within the realm of perspectives, belief systems, thoughts and emotions and physical events, seemingly physical. So a lot of my work focus on the third step. Also, a lot of my work focuses on the first two, but a lot of my work um, focuses on the third step. So we won't talk too much about that today. But it's good to notice, uh, or to know that it's part of this three step formula, right? So we have to know our relative selves, accept our relative selves. And then it's like our beingness, our mind body spirit complex becomes sort of this fit, integrated, 
whole potent trampoline for us to take the shuttle up into spirituality, mm -hmm. true spirituality transcendence, awakening, enlightenment, self-realization, higher states of consciousness, and so on. But how can one have access to that in debilitating states of suffering? Right. Um, for the most part, one can't. I mean, it's possible, it's definitely possible. And, and part of the methods that I'll be um, prescribing, so to speak, will allow for that access to deepen. So when we are in deeply afflictive states, the experience is that of extreme disconnect from source, from the creator that we are ultimately. So that third step of that true spiritual step, that quantum leaping into self-realization, enlightenment, realizing the oneness and so on, the universal love, we feel very disconnected from that. In fact, that is the pain, that feeling of disconnect. We can never be disconnected, but the feeling of disconnect is generated mm -hmm. by some perspective some believe that has such an opposite view to the truth of God, to the truth of source, to the truth of existence, to the truth of oneness, to the truth of our infinite worth, to the truth of our eternal nature, to the truth of our absolute freedom, to the truth of the cosmic perspective. Our perspective in a deeply afflictive state is so contradicting that infinite abundance, infinite love, and so on, that we feel the contrast between the truth and our perspective so strongly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's so strongly that it doesn't typically let us go. It doesn't allow our attention to wander away or to, to sort of rise up to the higher levels. And so we feel stuck in our bodies. We feel stuck in our emotions to a debilitating extent where we can't even mentally function normally anymore. We don't want to see other people. We, you know, it's got all kinds of expressions. Mm -hmm. um, so, for the basic understanding of this contrast between our connection to source, the truth that's always here, and our perspective, I, I'll just refer people to the episode we did in depth on the purpose of emotions, the emotional guidance system, how to use them and, also, uh, mm -hmm. and so on. So people can uh, watch that or listen to that, which is actually good prerequisite content for this episode. So now we're just highlighting, we're singling out the experiences that are so distracting that we can't focus on our spirituality anymore. Um, such as uh, chronic depression, um, sort of existential angst, mm -hmm. deep sort of confusion, um, lethargy because of this deep rooted sense of unworthiness, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Or even temporary jealousy or heartbreak or... Mm. True. Yeah, the, the responses that we give to certain circumstances, right. certain mm -hmm. catalytic circumstances that then trigger our perspective, our belief that we're lacking something very important to us. Right. Which is another way of saying, like, we believe we're disconnected from source. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how to deal with those states if you experience one? Whether it's through, like, a sudden heartbreak or the death of a loved one or um, or whether it's just sort of a state that you have become familiar with for quite some time, but it won't let you go, like it's causing you deep suffering every day. There are several ways to handle this that has benefits, beneficial ways to deal with it cool. without having to use substances and so on. Now, there's a lot of nuances here. Um, because it really is a case by case basis in the end. So people have to sort of take this general knowledge and apply it in a way that is helpful for them in their situation and their selves. So they have to know themselves and then apply this to themselves in the best way, according to their own um, intuition. So a few ways that we can use these afflictive states. If the afflictive state is not too intense, uh, because here's the thing, more context this is important. The reason these states stay with us when they do, when they are there, the reason they don't dissolve is because we're not gaining the understanding and the acceptance mm -hmm. that are the first two steps. Mm. Because it sucks our consciousness into such a tiny little confined corner or perspective or point of view 
within the overall infinite existence that we really, in that sense, feel trapped. And because we feel trapped, we lack perspective. If we feel trapped in a little box, we lack the meta view, we lack the overview, we lack context, we see no context. All that we see is that we're suffering, that we're in pain, that our loved ones left us, or some other kind of catalyst. So we only see the details of the event that we select based on our insecurities and our fears. And we only see our perspective. So we're stuck in it. That's why it's so deeply painful. It's because we're lacking understanding. We're lacking perspective in that moment. Understanding and overview or perspective are somewhat synonymous. So if we don't have that perspective, then naturally our perspective is so small that it will contradict the nature of reality. And so we feel that strong emotion. If the afflictive state is not very afflictive, if, if it's just a general emotion, I would typically recommend people just use the emotional guidance system and they observe their emotion. They observe um, what they must believe is true in order to feel this way about this event or that person or this happening. And when we have just a general emotion, that's quite easy to do because we're not sucked into it all the way. Mm -hmm. So we still have some understanding. We still have some context. We still have some overview. We still have some access to the greater picture of things. We still have access to other points of view. Now, this one might be triggering. This one might be painful. Mm -hmm. But because we have access, to, at least to some degree, to other points of view, it's, uh, it's manageable. It's something we can observe. We're not completely locked into it. We're not completely identified with it. And therefore, we have the space to observe it. Mm -hmm. We have the space to understand it. So then in that case, which more applies to our session about the emotional guidance system for most sort of everyday general emotions and reactions. So let's say there's just a, an everyday sort of emotion, something gets triggered in us and it feels very annoying and it feels frustrating and it draws our attention in. However, we can still rationalize. We can still see that it's maybe not entirely true. On some level, maybe we realize that we're being a little irrational. Um, because we have access to other points of view. But when you're in a deeply afflictive state, you have no access to other points of view, or very, very minimally. Therefore, you might be able from the back of your mind to sort of know that you're no longer being rational, but you don't have access to that point. Of view. You're not seeing it from that point of view, right? So again, you're boxed and you feel imprisoned in your emotional experience. So this is where the understanding part makes sense as well. The the more space we have from our present perspective, from our activated perspective, the more distance we have, the more overview we maintain, the more we can understand that no point of view, although it's logical from its own point of view, the perspective is logical from its own point of view. We at the same time can realize that it's not the whole truth. We have access to sort of, we can, uh, what's the word, relativize? Is that a word? I don't know, but I like um, it. make relative to we can see what can, we can compare perspectives and be, well, maybe this is no reaction. What's going on here? Let me look mm. at it. it. It doesn't grip us by the gut or the heart and just takes us over. So again, in that case of the general everyday type of emotional reaction or trigger, apply the emotional guidance system and use it as a tool, as a reminder to get to, to know yourself. So the question, one of the main questions to ask yourself to get to know yourself is what must I believe or what perspective must I have? What definition or belief system must I have in order to have this feeling about this situation? Because again, if you didn't have that belief or definition or perspective, you wouldn't be able to have the emotional feeling. So every emotion is an invitation for us to get to know our perspectives and assist the process of know yourself understand yourself. And then once you understand it, like, oh, this is why I feel this way, because I believe if this person says that, that I'm not good enough. Hmm, great. I've now identified that belief. And I can now relativize that meaning, mm -hmm. contextualize mm -hmm. that meaning, compare it to other perspectives, other things that I've learned in life, other things that I also believe in and know. And through that comparison or relativizing, uh, principle, again, I don't know if that's an English word, but you understand what it means now, mm -hmm. to make relative to other perspectives, 
because we can do that, we maintain greater access to more of existence. And therefore, we feel better than we do in an afflictive state where we only have access to one perspective for the most part. Or it might be a series of perspectives, but it's all rooted in this one sort of core belief that's being triggered. Mm -hmm. So then moving on from the general emotional triggers to those more deeply afflictive states of deep suffering, intense suffering, debilitating suffering, where our entire sense of self is wrapped up in it, and we lose access to the vaster context of existence. And we can no longer make our experience relative to a bigger contextual view, the meta view what to do when that's the case, when you're just gripped at your very core, and there seems to be no way out. And I mean, this is the state people are in when they are contemplating suicide. It's like, yeah. I, I don't know how to get out of this state, right? Mm -hmm. I think in many ways, aside from people who are suicidal, it's way more common than we think, just people actually boxed in in this little, yeah, completely limited, completely separate, mm -hmm. I think it's quite common. I think a lot of people mm -hmm. just live their day to like their nine to five work life with this type of a. Totally, I agree. Yeah. So then moving on from our everyday sort of emotions where we don't lose all touch with reality. We don't lose all touch with other perspectives, even just human reality, you know, because I mean, human reality, meaning human perspective, the perspectives that are sort of um, accepted by all human beings, to be true to some degree, the paradigm of the human mind, basically. Yeah, to me, comparatively to what I know, that is equals suffering. It is, an, a, it is an afflictive state. However, compared to the even deeper, more boxed in afflictive states and perspectives that we can have, that's actually a breath of fresh air. Mm -hmm. It's context. It's what we call reality. Like, oh, I can rationalize. I can see that I'm being kind of irrational, that it's not completely true what I'm thinking. But again, if we then move move into those deeply afflictive states where all of our energy is sucked into this box of a perspective, of a belief, then how do we deal with that? Because now, even if we know about the emotional guidance system, we may not have access to it. We may not have access to any kind of wisdom or any feelings of relief or any sense of a bigger perspective. So then how do we deal with that in that moment when we have no inspiration to go on YouTube and watch one of my videos or listen to a guided meditation or meditate ourselves when it's just so consuming and so distracting? What do we do? What's left? In this type of state of mind, state of attention, state of consciousness, state of emotion, we cannot always go the route of understanding ourselves, because we don't have access to it, because understanding requires context. You see, you cannot understand something unless you stand under it, so to speak, unless mm -hmm. you're beyond mm -hmm. it. So as long as we stand beyond what we're perceiving, as long as we have space around the perspective that's generating the emotion, we can observe it, trace it back to its root belief or perspective, compare that to what else we know about life, what else have we learned, what else do we truly believe, and or faith in our infinite nature, even if we don't fully believe in it yet, but we can compare our painful perspective to something that we've learned in sort of these spiritual teachings, for example, and we can gain faith and we can in that way, ease the emotion, deepen our understanding and release the core belief and accept ourselves in the process. But if you're completely sucked into the moment energetically, and you don't have any access to any of that, what do you do? Like I said, you cannot really understand because you lack perspective. Therefore, the understand yourself step kind of goes out the window. And that's quite okay. We don't always have to understand why we have hmm. certain emotions. It's helpful, but we don't always have to. Um, sometimes not understanding our emotions and having such a deeply afflictive state that completely draws in our attention and boxes us in is a great teaching tool that teaches us other types of understandings, quantum leaps, and it can sort of enforce a self-acceptance at a deeper level, because we don't even have the understanding. If we understand something, typically it's easier to accept it, because now our rational mind is involved, our logic is involved, our perspective is involved, our conscious mind is involved. But what if you can't understand? exactly why you feel the way you feel. You just feel overwhelmed by the mm. feeling. 
Now you can, in a sense, skip the understanding step. It will always come later anyway. And try to go to the acceptance stage if you can. Okay. So here's one way to deal with afflictive states. And to use an analogy to further elucidate the distinction between sort of an everyday emotion that's not super high on the scale of being afflictive versus a deeply afflictive state would be like being on a train station and having many different trains to choose from. You can go on this train, that train, and you know they go to different directions. So you might experience the train that's right in front of you, but you know you can get to a next, um, to a different, uh, what do you call it, platform and take a different train. So you have options. The difference is options, perspectives are available to you. In a deeply afflictive state, you're already on the train you're on. And what can you do when you're on the train you're on? You can't jump off, you can't choose another train. Mm. So it feels very limiting. It feels very constrictive and therefore debilitating. You're on a train you don't want to be on and you're going in a direction you don't want to be going in. But you're on it and you can't, you know, the only thing to do would be to jump out of a train, but that would equal suicide, which I would try to avoid. So, so then you're on this train and your only option is therefore to accept. What is to accept your current state? So, but even the thought, if you're in a truly deeply conflict, afflictive state, even the thought of self-acceptance is not always that available. Right. So in those more extreme afflictive states, I recommend, there's a couple of things you can do. I'm going to prescribe three methods. One is use this as an invitation because you have no other options in that moment to change your feeling state. You always do, but it doesn't seem like you do. You don't feel like you have access to it. You try as hard as you can, but it's not working. So since you have no other options anyway, use this as an opportunity to get to know the ability that you have, the innate ability to direct your focus. So this is different than trying to work with the perspective. So give up working with the perspective. Again, only when you're in a really deeply afflictive state, otherwise it can be helpful to deal with perspectives and understand them. But if you can't, then you simply can't. And so in that moment, what I would recommend is grab a hold of your attention itself. Notice that you can direct your attention to something. Now, ideally, this is the God state, for example, the state of awareness, love, light, but sometimes you simply won't be able to do that. Or you will feel like you won't be able to do that. So but that doesn't matter so much, you can focus your attention on anything that takes you out of the perspective that you're in it may take some time. So this is practicing concentration. So you're using your deeply afflictive state as a concentration exercise. Because you have no other options, it's either intense suffering, or slightly less suffering with the training of your concentration. So choose anything, the image of a mountain, or uh, the concept of space, or a feeling in your body that's not affected by the afflictive state. Some feeling of peace, some feeling of stillness, perhaps, in, in the storm, amidst the storm of your emotions. But the key here is to not try to change what you're experiencing because you already hopped on the train and you, mm. you have to wait until the next station. Mm. In between, you can't do anything. And right now, your afflictive state can be seen as being on a train in between two stations. Mm. And you know at some point it's going to change. Now, some people are on a very long train ride from one station to the next, but the train can be rerouted to an intermittent station that you didn't see coming if you practice concentration. Because focus is everything in these states. You always have access to focus on one thing more than the other, always. This free will is never taken from you, no matter how afflictive your state of emotions is. If you grab a hold of your concentration of your attention itself, and you direct it onto something that is not directly related to your suffering, like I said, a mountain, or a memory, or space, or if you can, faith in God, faith in that all is well, 
that a station will come your way. So just simply write this one out. Don't try to change the train because you can't. Don't try to change your emotions because you can't. Don't try to relativize your perspectives because you can't. If you can, great. But if you can't and you notice repeatedly, I can't, I can't, it doesn't work, it doesn't work. It continues to even make the emotion bigger and more highlighted. And I feel even worse because it's not working and da da da. So then you got to get out of the frustration about your afflictive state as much as you can. Because there's often a lot of layers of frustration and, and unself worthiness and lack of self esteem and all that added onto the afflictive state when we're having it because we can't change it and we can't function properly. And so we blame ourselves further and judge ourselves further. But this is not due to the afflictive state. This is due to our lack of concentration on something else. Mm. So in those moments where you're on the train, you can't change anything seemingly. Grab a hold of your attention and just just focus, focus as as pristinely as you can. Ignore, let be, allow whatever it is to be exactly as it is, and take your attention itself and focus it, point it in a different direction. Point it on something that is not that perspective or emotional state. That's not that circumstance. You could call it ignoring. Ignore what is experienced as much as you can, which is better in this case than trying to change it. So you ignore it as often as you can, as frequently as you can, for as long as you can. And this is not something that requires like physical effort. You know, I don't want people to have the image of like uh, squinting eyes and like, uh, yeah. you know, <laughs> wrinkles forming on your forehead, like you're concentrating. It's not that because that's all part of the afflictive state. So it's like you want to almost drop, drop underneath your current experience, let it be, give up, don't try to change it, realize you can't change it right now. And that's okay, find some acceptance with that. And instead, go one step back to your attention itself, knowing that what's right in front of you, if you open your eyes, is the suffering. But if you close your eyes, symbolically speaking, if you go back one step in your interior experience, you can grab a hold of your attention itself, and you can concentrate on something else. It doesn't have to be meaningful, but it can. But not if it conjures up more negative emotions. Because if now, let's say you're now using that, you're grabbing your attention and you're starting to focus on God and the spiritual teachings. But because you have no access to it, all kinds of negative thoughts about it start flowing in and developing a negative relationship to spirituality or to God, or like, mm -hmm. why am I experiencing this? God must not love me. So then that's not a productive way. That's not effective to concentrate on that. So in that case, something meaningless is actually more effective. So focus on the substance of wood, for example, like, cause I'm just looking at this table right now, it's a beautiful wooden table. And just appreciate the way that the light reflects of and how it shows different textures and just keep focusing on that. Bring your attention to the detail of something else. And mostly two things happen. One is you begin to take away the energy, the inertia, the momentum behind your perspective. So you're starting to rob it of the fuel that it needs, which is your attention to survive. So you're actually, you're actually suffocating the core perspective in that moment, that is giving you such a deep afflictive state, such a contracting feeling, and you're depriving it of that fuel and you're, you're starting, you're beginning to reroute it. And don't be in a rush with this. Just know this is a long term game, almost nice. like, it can take you hours. That's okay. It can take you hours to find some relief. But you, what's your other option? Right. Yes. Your other option is just to further exacerbate what you already have going on, further add fuel to that momentum and further frustrate yourself. So since you have no other option, since you can't go to the beach and hang out with your friends and have fun, since you can't go plan your next most exciting project because you have no energy for it, and you're so distracted by these emotions, then really suddenly it sounds quite appealing to focus on a wooden table for three hours, right? That's because great. it's not normally appealing. It wouldn't normally appeal to the ego, but if that gives you even a little bit of relief, oh, you know, when you're in like intense physical pain and it just dissipates by 20%, it's like, oh, you feel even better than when you normally feel when you have no pain and you're just distracted and it's just a random moment. Yeah. Because the contrast of going from intense pain to slightly less pain feels like pleasure almost. 
And you can train this in yourself to concentrate on something meaningless and hold on to that, not with tension, but with subtlety, if you can. So ignore the loud thoughts as much as you can. Let them be, accept them. Don't try to change them because it's not working. Drop into a subtler realm where attention itself becomes aware of itself. And now you can redirect this attention to a completely different view. And it might take practice because you're distracted by your thoughts. So you concentrate little by little, little by little, you notice more details. And what you start to notice after a while of going back to your new, let's say the table that you're focused on, or the image of the mountain, or some feeling in your perspective that's not bothered or that's not somehow affected by the rest of the canvas of your experience. If you can find one little spot in the canvas, in the painting of your present experience, that's somehow not turbulent that's somehow still or unaffected. And you just, just develop that sober attitude, just radically stop wanting it to disappear, the suffering, radically stop wanting pleasure, radically stop wanting to change your life, Rad just stop all that, because it's not working. All you do is you suddenly become excited about the simplest, soberest, most, most mundane thing, which is to focus on wood. And you, first of all, you start to discover things about wood you never knew. <laughs> but, but the most important part here is that you're suffocating the perspective, you stop feeling the perspective that generates the reflective state. So you'll start to notice more and more and more relief. And now this energy momentum of your attention begins to pick up momentum in a different direction. Mm -hmm. And you're gaining perspective again. Don't immediately go back, try to understand the suffering because you're not ready yet you're going to be sucked right into that vortex of momentum. And you're going to be mm -hmm. stuck in the same perspective, because it's the more you think about it, the more convincing it seems again. Have you experienced that where oh, there's yeah. some yes. situation in your life, and you have some relief from it for a little bit, and you're like, Oh, I'm done. No, I'm, maybe I'm over it or whatever. <laughs> and then something you get some text message or like some <laughs> picture on Instagram that reminds you of this or that situation or that person that has something to do with. And boom, you start thinking again, this was unfair, this is not good, this is, oh, da, 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 oh but this is gonna, oh. and immediately you're back in the vortex. And when you're back in that energy of negative, afflictive states and perspectives, it's again, going to be pretty hard to get out of it. Yeah. yeah. So you, you want, if it's a truly afflictive state, give yourself permission to ignore it for quite some time. I love that. Not as an attitude of denial, but as a, as a sign of faith in yourself, that you'll come back around to it when you're ready. But right now you don't have the means, meaning understanding or context or perspective or meta view. You don't have the means to deal with it, to understand it, to resolve it, to heal it in a relative way. You got to go and ignore it for a while. And you've got to take your attention away from fueling that perspective. You've got to gain different experiences that are outside of that box that give you confirmation of your worth, they give you confirmation of your self esteem, they give you confirmation, positive self esteem, they give you confirmation that there is hope, that give you confirmation that there's other things to focus on in life, they give you confirmation that maybe it's not as bad as it seemed. And focusing on a wooden table can be your initial way out of that energy momentum, something meaningless. And it's all about concentration, subtle attention, redirection, repeatedly, just commit fully to that because what's the alternative, my friend, it's absolute suffering and pain and destructive behavior. So suddenly, doesn't it sound quite exciting to redirect your attention and concentrate, um, place your attention on something that allows you to not be in the perspective that generates that emotional suffering. Nice. I love the rationalization of that of just looking at the ultimatum of of an afflictive state. Like, if this is my only option, then it makes anything else quite appealing. Nice. But I think a lot of times people just don't have the um, the context even enough to make it into an ultimatum. They think they are gonna solve it by continuing to think about it and think about it. But mm -hmm. so that's what I love the permission to just. That's a great point. Yeah. yeah, they think that by staying in it, they're somehow going to fix it. Right. Mm -hmm. And this at least gives you a direction of your focus. Because I think one of the worst things about those states is feeling how directionless it is. And you're kind of searching for a direction, you're like searching for a way out, but you just 
can't find it. And it becomes your whole reality, your whole world. Mm -hmm. And when there's sort of a way out or a window, it's mm -hmm. yeah, such a massive relief. Great. Yep. So the second method, which is very closely related to this one, but it's just sort of the next somewhat more advanced, perhaps step. And whether or not this is a more advanced step basic, uh, kind of depends on your prior experience with resting in awareness, with resting in sort of peer presence and beingness and awareness aware of itself or attention aware of attention or consciousness aware of consciousness. This is a subtle practice this is the science of self realization or the art of self realization. It's where the self that witnessing consciousness becomes aware of its own essence, its own nature, its own presence, its own existence. And then it more and more maintains that existence awareness, that self existence awareness. If you can do this, that's fantastic. It's the same exact principle, exact principle as focusing on wood and just staying with it subtly, staying with it subtly, staying with it, getting distracted by it, returning to it, staying with it, staying with it, generating a different momentum. If you can apply this principle of concentration on attention itself, then you start to drill in the direction of the well of well-being, the well of joy, the well of love, the well of bliss, the well of transcendence, the well of knowing yourself. So that's great if people can do that, they can just stay with that sense of I am, I exist. And sometimes we give ourselves from a higher self's point of view, we give ourselves these catalytic, catalytic events to really purge ourselves of the perspectives that lay dormant within us mm. that then come out full force and we have no other perspective, no access to other perspectives. We really feel the full blow of it. But then because it's so all consuming, it's a great opportunity to not try to get into it and understand the relative mechanics of our thoughts, but to just sort of bypass it altogether for a period of time, not as an attitude of denial, but as an attitude of faith and just logic, like this is all that works for me right now. And I'll come back to it later when I have the space and the clarity and the perspective I need to change that perspective into, into a proper understanding of the way reality works and my true worth and my true infinite nature and so on. So if in that moment you can hold on just to attention itself, being aware of itself, then that's sort of a step up that's more beneficial than focusing on the wooden table. But the initial step, if you don't have access to anything that subtle, focus on something that you know you can maintain concentration on, that's less subtle than consciousness, that's more obvious, like the wooden table, which is reflecting light in a certain pattern right now, or anything. I mean, this is just one example. People should choose whatever they have access to. It doesn't matter what it is. What matters is that you redirect your focus. That's all that matters. So whatever you feel you can focus on that doesn't generate, that's one requirement, it doesn't generate negative emotions. So you're not focused on a topic that means something to you that you could conjure up negative thoughts about or mm -hmm. beliefs. Hence the wooden table, because most people don't have beliefs or definitions about that. It doesn't matter to them. And if you can maintain that, then you can progress and just hold on to awareness itself, consciousness itself, I exist itself. You could try that immediately if you have prior experience with it. But if not, it'll just frustrate you. Like, oh, well, I can't find enlightenment. I can't find right. myself. Da, da, da. So only do that step, the second version of this method, if you know you can. But then it's a great opportunity. Then it's a great catalyst because now you're forced to concentrate. Whereas when you don't have such an afflictive state, you're easily distracted by your addiction to sense pleasures and sensuality and hope and promise of a better future and this and that and relationships and validation from others and all these ego boosters, success. You're so distracted by that. But when you're faced with a, with a brick wall or a train that you're on that you cannot step off of, and you've got to experience what you experience, accept it and move your attention. Don't try to change it. In other words, let it be, let it be exactly as it is. Don't try to change even a single ounce of it. Don't want anything to change from your emotional state. This frees up your attention to focus on something else. Become fascinated with the details of the table. Do this for hours if you need to, because again, what's the alternative? You know, it's quite exciting suddenly. Do that. If you can't focus on I exist, just the feeling I exist, that's spaceless, spacious, but spaceless, timeless feeling I am. 
and rest in it, stay with it. And then notice, oh, as soon as you start suffering, you're back in the mind. Great reminder. Normally you're distracted by pleasure, but now that you all, you only know pain when you go out into the mind field, which is kind of like a mind field, hmm. then you're instantly remembering, you're instantly reminded in a very obvious, painful way that you've lost attention of I exist. So use this, if you have prior experience with the I am, and this is one of your passions, then especially use the afflictive states to become anchored in that consciousness of consciousness itself. And it doesn't take long then, if that's successful, it doesn't take long for the afflictive state to leave you, to disappear, to diminish over time, but rather rapidly, sometimes instantly, if you sort of hit a new level of freedom and perspective. Because again, emotions are the reaction to a perspective that you're having because they're guidance. It's a guidance system. So if suddenly you change your perspective by drilling into the I am that 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 I am I'm conscious, I'm conscious, I'm conscious. I'm aware, I'm aware, I'm aware, I'm aware, I'm aware, I'm aware, and you stay with that, stay with that, stay with that. As soon as you go out of it, the feeling is that okay, I am, I am, I am. You know, coax yourself into this repeatedly, repeatedly, subtly, no stress, but concentrate. Give yourself this gift. Ignore the thing, let it be, focus on I exist, I exist, I exist. Or wooden table, wooden table, wooden table. Clear blue sky, clear blue sky, clear blue sky. What can you learn about the clear blue sky that you've never noticed before? Go there, go there, go there. Fantasize if you must. If you can't concentrate on one state, fantasize a little bit about that one topic that has nothing to do with the things that trigger your emotions. Something meaningless that you could discover some form of beauty in perhaps even. Not meaning, but beauty mystery, awe, some sense of like, oh, respect. Mm. This will change your energy. And then suddenly you have, act because you're in a higher frequency, now you have access to different songs coming through the radio because you've dialed your radio, your body, your mind, your attention to a different range of frequencies. Therefore, the song that you're hearing, the emotions that you're feeling, the response of your emotional guidance system that's now responding to your new perspective once it's stabilized is going to be a stable, steady, song of that is commensurate with how much that perspective is in or out of alignment with source. If it's closer in alignment than your previous perspective, the afflictive state is going to pale in comparison to your next negative state, which will feel very positive comparatively, right? And so you just built this, you bump this up a little bit every time you move your frequency up, your perspective up. Once over time, over days, over weeks, maybe over months, maybe over years, when you're able to stabilize and you've gained so much new perspective of yourself and of life and your symbiotic relationship of yourself and life and your self-esteem has changed. Now you can look back upon such things without getting sucked into them because you maintain the overview. Mm -hmm. So now what used to trigger an afflictive emotion becomes more like a general everyday type of emotion that you can now study if you, if you want to observe and get to understand why was I feeling that way? Because I believe that that situation meant I was abandoned. Now I see I was never abandoned. My higher self, cosmic consciousness of God, it was all present in me that very moment. I just couldn't see it, but I see it now. So now bringing my current perspective to that sort of past perspective that was at the time, all I could see. And therefore the emotions that could respond to that were only negative. Now I, I can look at that perspective, even look through the lens of it a little bit, but I can't believe in it anymore because I've learned too much about life. I've learned too much about my freedom. I've learned too much about my existence. So there's no way that this thought could now convince me to feel that way, to believe that way and therefore feel that way. This is similar to the relationship episode we did mm -hmm. where I sort of describe the process of being in deeply afflictive states about a partner leaving me and now kind of just that causing a giggle in a way where I can't believe in that perspective anymore. That cost me so much pain. That seemed to be my mm -hmm. entire reality at the time. So emotions are not factual. They're never factual. They're always the opposite of factual mm -hmm. if we take it all the way. Any emotion is evidence that we're not seeing things clearly. Hmm. But again, we address this in depth in the emotional guidance system episode. So again, I uh, refer people to that one. So um, 
cool. And, Method two. I love, I love basically using an afflictive state as meditation boot camp practice. And forcer, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's your higher self forcing you to sit your ass down and yeah. realize more of yourself. Yeah, drill sergeant. Yeah. Love it. So in that sense, it's a gift. And you can see that. Me looking back at my own afflictive faces in life. I just see how they purged and reprioritized my entire focus. So I'm only grateful for them. And I can only see how benevolent and divine of you or, or intelligent mm -hmm. that guidance system was. But at the time, I couldn't see that for sure. So it's all good. It's all, mm -hmm. it's all you giving this gift to yourself. I know it doesn't feel that way when you're in it. But you'll see that later on. Have faith in that. That alone can bring you some soothing mm -hmm. feelings mm -hmm. that will take you a little bit out of that momentum of the afflictive state. Mm -hmm. Now, another step one could take, which arguably is even more advanced. Is this the third method? The third method, okay. yeah. Would be to investigate. But I really don't recommend this for most people because you got to sort of have this clarity already practiced to a high degree in order to not fall into an intellectualizing process with yourself. But it's asking you the yourself the question, who is it? What is the me that believes it's the one that's at the end of the stick of this experience? Who is this me? What is this me? that believes this experience belongs to or pertains to or is happening to or is created by. Because there is no such me, it is just another idea, a notion of belief. So by asking that question, it's like our attention turns away from the canvas and back onto the viewer, the assumed participant or experiencer of the experiences, the assumed me or ego or sense of self that we just always throw into the mix, whatever we see in life, whatever we experience, oh, there it is, the sense of me at the root of that experience. Because without that sense of me, you wouldn't feel like that experience belongs to you, or that it affects you. So it's kind of the self inquiry method as taught in some Advaita Vedanta, Ramana Maharshi. Mm -hmm. um, it's the question, what is I? Or who am I? But who am I is is a bit more uh, so there's connotations to that. yeah there's in, in english i think it's sort of a mistranslation personally from nanyar or nanyar which is self-inquiry the english translation who am i i think is quite confusing to people mm -hmm. i think what is I, I love that is better or what is me or who is me but who am i is too common tongue right. language yeah. and it has these connotations to it so i would recommend the question what is me and this draws the attention to the root, the experiencer, which believes it's the victim of its experience, always. And then we can dissolve that notion. And then we become freer and freer and freer from being affected by all the emotions and thoughts and perspectives of a limiting nature. And then God realization becomes really stable and starts to really shine forth. And less and less do we assume this false identity that then suffers. But this is a more advanced process. And it requires sort of a keenness and a subtlety of mind being already developed. So they're kind of in order, focus on something meaningless, bring all your concentration to that in as relaxed as subtle a manner as possible, while you let the rest of your experience just kind of be and go and ignore it. Mm -hmm. And just start focusing in a different train of thought, consistently, consistency, relentlessly, consistently, cons what's your better option, just go and fucking do it. Give yourself that gift. I know it's boring. So we're, yes, it seems like you're ignoring your problems and you can't figure out this thing that you think is so important. It's giving you so much pain, but what, that's the alternative. And you've been in it probably for days, probably for weeks, probably for months, maybe it's not paying off. The things you think you need to attend to clearly are not the things you need to attend to. You need to shift your focus, your attention, grab a hold of your attention, consistently focus on something meaningless. This creates, this reroutes the energy. Then when that opens up, you can recognize awareness. You can rest in the I amness. And then you can ask the question, what is the me that I even believe is the experiencer of these emotions? And then you can dissolve the me more and more. And the victim, therefore, this, this relentless victimization that we have 
that we always insert into our experience with no good reason whatsoever. There's no proof for a little me. There's no evidence for it. There's bodies walking around, but that's not evidence of a me inside the body. So it's a core assumption that's causing all the suffering. It's the root misaligned belief is that I am a me that's somehow not God, that's somehow different from infinite reality. Cool. So what was the last afflictive state that you uh, experienced yourself? And which of these methods did you use? If any? Yeah, I've, I mean, I've used all of them, you know, mm -hmm. like alternatingly, whatever worked, whatever I had access to in that type of moment, I would use. I'm asking about the most recent one, though. But I'm also curious, because earlier you said that like even a normal state of human walking around is an afflictive state for you. Not a human walking around. It's the human beliefs. It's what we call normal. It's what people see as reality. So reality is quite stable. Our collective reality perspective is quite stable. We're people, we're, this is what's normal. This is what's not normal. Just because someone says something to you doesn't mean you have to take it personally. Therefore, you can relativize and be back in human reality. Like, oh, yeah, that was, those were just a bunch of words. So there's no real reason for me to continue this emotional perspective. Oh, okay, so I'm back in human reality, the human context. But there's so many flawed premises at the foundation of human perspective, what's humanly accepted as normal, that to me, any of those beliefs would feel similar. If I really believed in them, I would feel similarly constricted as someone who believes they've been wronged or this or that. Mm -hmm. So it's just a matter of perspective and what you're anchored in, what state of frequency is your predominant state. And the higher you go in that frequency, the freer you become, the more free you become also from this human paradigm of thought and belief. As for the most recent afflictive state, I honestly wouldn't be able to tell because an afflictive state, I've had similar echoes as afflictive states in my experience, but they can't quite be compared to when you really believe in them. The closest thing probably was during my sort of process with the negative media kind of attacking me and giving all these distorted images of my work and my intentions and my character. And then all the effects this had on the people around me, uh, the crew, friends around me, and, and the audience and so forth. I think that was the most recent thing that would be somewhat comparable to having afflictive states. I have deep emotional waves occur from time to time, but they're no longer personal and they always serve some kind of a teaching discourse or they're, they're always inspiring me towards a certain direction. So it's a type of guidance mm -hmm. for what's going on in a collective. I might wake up some days and be overcome with this feeling, but it's not personal. Therefore, it's not really an afflictive state, even if the emotional energy can be very intense and high mm. and backed up with like lots of energy. It's not quite the same as an afflictive state because I'm not locked into that perspective, which is the crucial difference, Got right? It. Yeah. I don't believe that something is happening to me. It makes all the difference. So while the emotions can be just as intense in terms of their energy appearance, in terms of the feeling of it, as someone in an afflictive state, it's still not an afflictive state because I'm not on a train. I'm not in, the, I'm, I'm experiencing the train fully. I'm experiencing all the nuances of that train, but it's like, I'm just a ghost that hovers through the train. It's like a visitor I can view and, and I can gain some knowledge from it somehow or channel it into a teaching for people, but it's not me. Like at any point I can exit the train. Like watching a movie of... Like watching a movie, exactly. Yeah. So there's echoes like that and there's some, some collective insights that happen through those kinds of experiences. But because this has gradually shifted to freedom more and more over the course of my life, that's why I can't really say when was my most recent afflictive state, because even in those whole, that period that I just mentioned with uh, the negative media and, and um, friendships breaking up and, and people believing all kinds of nasty things about me, 
even that was already backed up with a lot of perspective and freedom. So yes, it, it that was the most intense recent memory that felt perhaps the closest to being personal mm -hmm. or hitting some kind of a personal assumption of me. Mm -hmm. um, but even so, I can't say that it's the same as like when my lover left me when I was 18 hmm. years old or something like that. You right. know? It's a different type of, because uh, there's no, there's no real stuckness. There is stickiness to it though. That, that, so that's why I would call that the gotcha. most recent kind of afflictive state, but mm -hmm. it was already very malleable. It, it would only sting in the way that an afflictive state would make you feel stuck for a short amount of time. And then the excess would immediately return. And so it doesn't mean I wouldn't still feel the perspective and emotion. It doesn't mean I wasn't processing it and understanding it and trying to get to the root of what's the most balanced approach to this from love and wisdom being in unity. So there was a process involved. There was some stickiness involved, but again, it wasn't like I was completely stuck in the experience. So yeah, even though it felt more intense than my lover leaving me at a certain age, like when I was younger, even though these experiences were more intense, they were less afflictive or less constricting. They mm. were less limiting. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So there's a difference there. That's why freedom doesn't have to mean that we have no emotions. I mean, that's a very advanced state of consciousness where there are no emotions consistently. Um, what's more important is that we can let our experience be as it is and relativize and continue to have access to a bigger perspective. That's a more relevant step for where we're at as human species right now. To realize that freedom doesn't mean you don't experience a certain emotion or you don't experience a certain perspective. It means that you're not constricted by it. You can see beyond it while it's happening. So then you can experience more and more simultaneously peace and freedom and bliss and pain and suffering and confusion which sounds very weird, but you can have a simultaneous experience where they both coexist within the same state of consciousness or space of consciousness. What about disconnect? You, ex you like experience disconnect while not having disconnect apply to you. That's a good way actually of making the distinction. The experience of disconnect hasn't happened for me for a long time, except maybe there were a few very short moments which served a particular purpose. Um, mainly to, for a moment, give me a taste of what it's like again, mm -hmm. to be in the shoes of some of the people that I'm sharing my message with. So it generates, because if you don't have that experience of disconnect for, let's say, two years in a row, your perspective changes so much. And, and your perspective of stuckness and victimization changes so much that it becomes kind of difficult to relate to someone who believes they're disconnected, stuck or victimized. Mm -hmm. You can, you can understand it, but, but sometimes I guess I've wanted for myself or needed, um, sort of a reminder of, Oh, this is what it feels like when you have no access. So my experience of that is that even that wasn't personal still, that was me from a higher level of my consciousness than my ordinary physical consciousness, giving me a taste and experience of disconnect that is very much out of my own free will. That's how that was experienced. Like within your own free will? Within know. my own free gotcha. will, I was fully aware that I experienced the disconnect, but at the same time I was fully aware. So I experienced the disconnect as real in that moment, but still I was fully aware of the fact that I was choosing it for mm. a purpose. Because at some point you can't, you just can't disconnect entirely anymore. Right. And that's what I hope to give um, people access to, through this kind of work, because it's worth it. It's worth the practice. It's worth the understanding. And it's people's birthright to understand this and to be free and to ever know their connection to source. And it will heal everything. It will heal everything in our thinking. I think what you said earlier was important to remember that we can never truly be disconnected, but only feel that we are disconnected. Mm -hmm. Yep. And this might be too intellectual to really hit home if you're in an emotional state, but it can still be somewhat helpful. If you realize 
in a moment where you feel so disconnected, if you remember that, first of all, you cannot ever be disconnected from consciousness, from God, from existing, from this infinite creation. And the proof for that in that moment is the fact that you're feeling disconnected. If you know the emotional guidance system and how it operates, because of your connection to the true reality of God, you can feel the emotional guidance system kicking in as the feeling of disconnect when you're believing that you're disconnected. The feeling of disconnect is just an emotion. It's just showing you the contrast of your belief in disconnect with the truth of connection. So the feeling of disconnect is evidence that you're still connected. So it's a bit intellectual perhaps, but I think it can provide people with some uh, some relief in those moments, if you remember that. Mm -hmm. You can never truly be disconnected. It's impossible. And the proof for that is that you feel disconnected. That's the irony, but so you can use it in that way. Yeah. So when we then enter into a greater state of freedom, we again gain perspective. And as a result, the understanding and the acceptance of ourselves becomes easier. But you cannot accept something from the state of being that is creating that very experience of, of affliction. So you have to kind of step out of it. Because again, what is understanding? It is having more than one access point or perspective. You can't understand object A, if you're not also having object or space B to compare it with. Understanding is a process of comparison. Mm. It's a process of contrast. It's a par process of context. It's a process of having multiple views. A thing can never understand itself. It needs an observer. Similarly, your thought process cannot understand itself. It needs a different perspective to view that object or that thought. But if you have become so identified, unified with that perspective that's causing the afflictive state, then you can't understand it. So don't even try, let it be. Focus on your access point to a new perspective, which again, can just be meaningless object that you're concentrating on. And then the acceptance, the acceptance of self will follow the understanding of that will naturally follow over time. As you gain access again to greater freedom. If you really gain access to freedom, then it's instantly understood, typically. It's very like, ah, oh, of course, because you just see from such a clear point of view, there's no substance, there's no matter, there's no gravity anymore to the perspective that was impossible to understand when you were in its gravitational field. And you had not a bigger gravitational field of your own to contrast it by, to understand it with. So know yourself, accept yourself and become the creator. These are very much linked. The more you become the creator, the easier it is to know and understand and accept yourself on a relative level as well. And sometimes not having access to it, to accepting your uh, to understanding yourself leads instantly into accepting yourself. And then that opens the door again to knowing the creator. And then when that afflictive emotion again arises, you understand it, and you'll be able to accept it because you have a new space of consciousness to compare it to to understand it by. That's kind of the journey of using or how I would use anyway, these afflictive states to resolve them, to understand them, to accept them and to transcend them. Yeah, it's helpful to recognize and to remember that it's an afflictive state. I think that the moments where I've been in these kind of experiences, I haven't, I didn't recognize that it was just a state. It was like, this is the end of the world, the end of my world. This is an affliction that I'm never going to get out of. And it just becomes like, oh, this, this black hole. And not the good kind. Um, <laughs> um, I love the good kind of black hole. <laughs> Just the right black hole. Oh, it's so great. <laughs> it's true though. There's, I know. There's a delicious black hole and there's a terrible black hole. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's so helpful to recognize it's just a state and that um, it is happening to you because you can handle it and you actually mm -hmm. want to teach yourself through this. Um, and it, to me, I did feel like, I don't know if I can handle this. I don't know if I can get through this. Uh, but now looking back, I can see that the fact I was even experiencing it to begin with was proof that I could handle it and get through this. Mm. 
on a higher level it's like my understanding is that it's um a really terrible afflictive state is sort of the accumulation of a lot of misunderstandings and misperspectives and then it's just you're ready to make a quantum leap so it your higher self just says okay take it all at once um you got this yeah um so yeah, it's so helpful to recognize that you you have got this if you're experiencing it and you've chosen it nice that is so helpful yeah and you you wouldn't have chosen it if you couldn't yeah. handle it beautiful because the worst part about it is not even the emotions it's mm -hmm. to believe that you're all alone that you can't handle it that god doesn't love you or that you're mm -hmm. uh, that you're somehow unworthy or abandoned that's the most painful part of these things that you're a victim of it that there's no way out of it that there's yeah. no help no guidance no love mm -hmm. no that's the most painful perspective it's not even the initial emotional trigger right? and actually this reminds me of a, a method another method people can apply when it's sort of in between the scale of emotional affliction between sort of the everyday emotional thing mm -hmm. that you can kind of play with and understand and investigate in between that and the emotion that is just so afflictive that you can't do anything with it. Um, and that is to just sort of bring full presence to the emotional feeling and to feel it without labeling it. Right now, if you're in a truly, deeply, extremely afflictive state, even that is not doable because you're too close to the perspective mm -hmm. that you have and it'll just conjure up more perspectives of a negative nature and you'll be distracted by them. So the only thing you can do is radically allow it to be as it is and therefore ignore it and change, grab a hold of your attention and place it somewhere else is all you can do. But if it's not quite that extreme, but it is quite painful, mm -hmm. it is like a heartbreak kind of thing or something like that. Um, but you have some space to interact with it without completely collapsing in it, then I can recommend also a simple method of just feeling the feelings, bringing awareness, awareness is always here, you don't bring it, but mm -hmm. allowing the feeling to be experienced and witnessed by awareness, by your consciousness, that innate principle of I am and I know that I am, allowing yourself to experience the feelings and just maintaining the witnessing state so that you don't go into thoughts about it. You don't define it. You don't label it. You don't try to intellectually understand the emotion. Intellectual insights might come as a result of just feeling the essence of the feeling without additions, without descriptions, just letting it be as it is. Um, and a beautiful thing can happen, typically, the more advanced we are in these spiritual practices of self-realization becomes easier, is that when we just become present to a feeling, we find a golden nugget within it, which is really the entire thing yes. is the golden nugget. Mm. In other words, when we stop resisting it with descriptions and labels and definitions and just feel it, just have the courage to mm. feel it just in its raw state, no intellectualizing, no definitions, no descriptions, stay as empty of describing it as you can. Don't describe your experience, just be it, just feel it mm. without getting lost in it. But you mm. can only get lost in a description. So, or definition or belief. So, but to just purely feel it, be fully present to it, you start to over time transmute it. You start to discover something beautiful, which is that every emotion is made up of the same presence, the same love that is the creator in manifest form in energetic form. So you're starting to access the essential energy manifestation of the infinite creator, that very sort of substratum essential first type of manifestation, that presence energy, that then is the prime, the primordial substance for everything else to be made out of. And if you can be with your feelings, without labeling them, without getting lost in the sensuality of them, without describing them, without trying to change them, just allowing them to be exactly as they are. If you can find that courage, that stillness, that presence, and then just feel them as they are, they begin to take on a golden shape, a golden color, if you will. They start to sort of radiate something else. That's not the described emotion. It is, yes, the emotional feeling is there, but because the definitions are dropped and the acceptance arises, now we start to align ourselves with this primordial energy field and therefore 
we start to see the love as the emotion. We start to see the emotion as being love, light, energy, that primordial, essential presence energy of God. And then we're transmuting it. And there's a sense of unity and inseparability with it. And then there's no problem. Mm -hmm. Because we're not opposing it, we're not resisting it, we're not against it, we're not trying to change it or control it. We're accepting it. And therefore, we're becoming one with the essence of it. And that just reveals itself to be this beautiful golden love light, if you will. That's very yeah. cool. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. It's kind of like the the first method then, like being present to the wood or being present to the, it's like that same focus on. Yep. Yes, exactly. But if it's a super afflictive state, that we only have access to negative emotions when we're present to our emotions, then you can't quite do that. Because you'll just get sucked into negative thoughts. Yeah, right. But if it's somewhere in between mm -hmm. sort of a random everyday emotion and a deeply afflictive state. So if it's like a sort of a deep heartbreak, but you're not totally victimized by it, you can see kind of through it and with it, then you can uh, beautifully apply this method and it's very healing. And you will then through that process, understand the emotion. Also, you will understand yourself through the acceptance of it, through the total allowance of it, and then the recognizing the essential energy that makes up the energy of the emotion by just feeling it by being present to it. It is exactly the same method, actually, mechanically speaking, as focusing on the wood of the table, and mm -hmm. the way light reflects off of it. Um, because what you're doing is you're taking your attention away from the definitions, and you're shifting it to something else. In this case, the presence of the emotion rather than the thought about the emotion. But if you're present to the emotional feeling, it's still very close to your conditioned, boxed in perspective that generated the emotional response in the first place. So it's not we don't always have access to this courage, this mm -hmm. naked present awareness that recognizes the essence of an emotion to be love and light. Um, if it's too convincing, if it's too painful, Mm -hmm. So then the only thing we can typically do is sort of ignore it and focus on something else entirely that's not meaningful to us, that doesn't trigger the same thoughts or perspectives. So there's this wide range sort of, mm -hmm. of fluidity to our consciousness, which emotions have a beautiful way of showing us how fluid and malleable our consciousness and our attention and our self-creating, self-conjuring up capacities really are. And we gain this freedom and this malleability through facing those emotions in different ways. But I did want to add that to sort of the in between mm -hmm. uh, type of emotion. That's yeah, great. Beautiful. Did you have a question? Yeah. Would these methods also apply for someone that's experiencing afflicted states in a group setting, for instance, or like social uh, encounters? Because um, I do feel a lot of people like experience like really intense anxiety, or different emotions when mm -hmm. they're like in a group setting. Yeah, in my experience, from my own experience, when I was in a truly afflictive state, I would not be in social situations. You know what I mean? I mm -hmm. mean, of course, it's possible it can happen. But typically, I wouldn't be hanging out and sort of being anxious. I would define that as sort of the in between, maybe either the general emotions or a little bit higher than that, a little bit more intense than that. But the truly extremely afflictive states are debilitating. You're not social, you just shut down, you're like, mm, you don't know what to do, da, da, da. You're, you're stuck. In most cases, of course, it's possible. But in most cases, I would say, in group settings, if you're even already in group settings, typically, that type of anxiety is more of an everyday type of nature. And it just comes with the package of your low self esteem. And thinking that you are a person inside of a body, which is impossible. But we believe it, we insert all the time, insert that back, um, that back burner sense of self that's on the back burner, it's just there, it's just in the background. I am experiencing this, I am being watched right now, you're not being watched, that's a total assumption. But because we have that sense of me, always inserted into the canvas of life, we have to investigate that. But therefore, we feel anxious in social circumstances. And then we can bring presence, the presence of awareness to it, and not define it, just allow ourselves to feel the discomfort of the anxiety, and not react and flee into thoughts or trying to change it, control it, stop it, avoid it, just find the courage to be naked with it, feel the vulnerability of it, until 
turns ultimately into a feeling of indestructibility. That's the golden you that comes out of it. But initially, just take those small steps to it more and more, break the chain of describing your experience and trying to change it and avoid it. And just let it be. Develop the courage of naked consciousness, of naked acceptance, naked awareness. Be naked, be naked, be naked, be naked. Allow, allow, allow to be as it is. And then gradually over time, you'll become that inner interior alchemist and it will change the color, the shape, the size, the nature, the feeling, the essence of the emotion will be revealed to you. You'll become a discoverer of God's love in all forms. So in social situations, I would suggest the anxiety is based in some ego construct and therefore you can allow it for the most part. You can practice that allowance and you can transmute it. Does that relate to or resonate with your example? I think so. I don't know. I just loved the energy of it, <laughs> like discovery of God's love. Cool. Uh, <laughs> but does that answer your, uh, your imagined scenario? Or you have a more specific kind of example or question about it? It does answer mine, but I'm kind of a, I want to position myself in someone that's maybe not that experienced with like just releasing and drop being more naked. Mm -hmm. um, so, well, what do you do then? If you're already more experienced in it, then you could teach the same answer to your question. How have you become more able to be more courageous and more naked with your anxiety and social circumstances? What's that first mm -hmm. access point that you would recommend to people? Mm, nice. Good question. <laughs> mm. <laughs> uh, it is to not wanting or not efforting to hide something or mm -hmm. believing that there's something wrong or that I need to hide something or that mm -hmm. I need or that I might be afraid something be revealed, nice. exposed. Yep. So that's like just creates these pockets where stuckness or anxiety can creep in. Mm -hmm. um, Great. Which kind of is the same thing that you were saying, like just being naked more and more. Mm -hmm. Yep. But I love your specific nuance of that being to drop the fear for the outcome in a way, uh, to drop the fear of being discovered and exposed. Because the what we call the ego, that imagined sense of me in the background of every canvas painting experience of our life, it always wants to hide its true falseness. It wants to hide the fact that it's not real. And it's got 10,000 different ways to do that, more probably. And these are all sort of layers of self-deceit, layers of self-control, layers of manipulation, layers of hiding, layers of avoiding, layers of recontextualizing things, layers of describing things in certain ways, layers of justifying things, layers of avoiding certain circumstances, certain people at certain times, all to avoid being seen by you, not by others, by you. Hmm. But you think it's you trying to avoid, that's because you're hijacked, right? We're hijacked by the false self. It's a hijacker of our sense of self. It's like a little virus. It's like a little COVID-19 called me. <laughs> and it's hijacked our consciousness, our sense of self. So now we're operating on behalf of COVID-19. So we're wearing masks because we don't want to be seen. We don't want to show our true selves. Um, so we think, but actually not the case at all. And if you can see this, you can break through very quickly but you gotta be ready to be free of your false self, which you think is you. That's the tricky part. It's like, you gotta be willing to have your ego die in front of you. But if you think you're your ego, you will never wanna die. Wow. It has hijacked you. It will consistently hide its self-deceiving layers. It will continue to lie and not know that it's lying or partially know that it's lying, but have yet another layer ready to justify why or how the lie is not really a lie or how everyone is lying in that way. So it's normal. So to burn through those layers of self-deceit, we need to know that we're not that hijacked version of ourselves. We're not the virus. We're not COVID-19. We're bigger than that. We are bigger than the one that feels anxious in that situation. So instead of us hiding from being exposed in the eyes of others, we need to realize that it's the ego not wanting to be seen by us. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. 
and is using us and other people to accomplish its, its aim. So we got to realize that the one who's afraid to be exposed is not us by others. It is the ego by us mm -hmm. using others. Fuck, I love that so much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you can see that, you can take a shortcut. You can take a direct route and cut the bastard off at the root using all the love in the world. Like love it to death. Be radically slice it off. Nope. I'm not going to lie to us. I'm not going to believe I am this person that feels anxious about being exposed because that's not me. It's just this hijacked person that's been in the back of my taxi for all my life, <laughs> taking on different shapes and sizes and forms and instructing me to go left and right. And, and I've just been doing its bidding. It hasn't paid me once. It hasn't paid me once. Maybe in childhood when I needed to navigate an, a, mm. a tricky emotion or or situation where, where my dad was abusive and I had to protect myself. There's some reason to that, right? So then we create this monster in the back of the seat that keeps us safe. Um, but that's for most people not necessary. It, now it's just a self-perpetuating story. And then it creates circumstances that seem to mimic that reality being needed because we're now identified with the voice in our head. But the voice in our head is observable and anything observable cannot be us. Anything. So the thinker cannot be us. Therefore, the hijacker, the mind, the ego cannot be us. So it's not us afraid to be exposed in the eyes of others. It's our own guest, our little beautiful, loving, monstrous guest in the back seat that doesn't want us to kick it out of our cab. And so it uses us to navigate and lie and manipulate and pretend and all that mm. stuff. Fun, huh? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's so cool. But the way to do that is to just gain more courage in naked exposure, because that's the, that's how we sever the connection between the hijacker and our true selves, between the analyzing, thinking, egoic mind and our true ever-present free self, which is already free of whatever we observe. But we identify with what we observe and we put it in the background of our subconscious and it continues to operate as if it's its own entity. And we think it is us and we think it defends us and it's on behalf of us, but it's not. It's robbing us of all our energy, inspiration, clarity, self-knowledge, truthfulness, sincerity, earnestness, love, compassion, spiritual progress, advancement, and so forth. So it's really not our friend anymore. It's time to let go of that toxic friendship. So expose it to death. Here's my most shameful moment, guys. I've been using all of you in the following way. Da, 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 da. If you can, you know, you, that's an extreme example, but you could, if you're ready to part ways with the monster in the backseat, uh, doesn't mean you should hate it because it has served you. You've invited it in. It's your choice. Hmm. It's not, you know, it's just offering its services. You've let it into your cap. So when I say monster, Yes, it's a monster, but it's really our own allowance. It's us enabling it. So it deserves sort of gratitude at the same time. Mm. It deserves our decision to sever all ties with it. I'm done with you. And at the same time, a feeling of, I love you. Thank you very much for your service, but it's no longer needed. So I'm not trying to imply that we should fight the ego because that just is more of the same thing. We should love it to death, but radically and decisively if we want quick progress and quick freedom and quick self-knowledge, and quick enlightenment. We need to be ready to part ways, and therefore, it doesn't matter what is exposed, because it's not us that's exposed. It's the ego, the monster in the back seat, that we are now becoming aware of. And you can use other people as reflectors to accelerate that. But it takes some courage. What is courage? Courage is, in this context, knowing that you're more than the guy in the back seat, the monster in the back seat. That's all it is knowing that you are more than the monster in the back seat of your mind. Once you know that, you have faith, you have courage. Now to expose the monster, it's not so big of a deal because you know you are more than the monster. You know that they can leave your cabin, you'd be fine without them. You no longer need them to protect you. You can now consciously reason and see and decide for yourself what is safe, what's not safe, what is true, what's not true. As a six-year-old, yeah, you need some protection. So you invite in this, uh, this monster in the back of your cap. But at some point, you got to kick him out, you know. 
lovingly. Thank you. <laughs> okay. This is your stop, okay, isn't bye it? Bye. Yep. Yeah. Okay, bye bye. <laughs> okay, bye bye. Okay, bye bye. <laughs> okay, bye bye. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh oh. Bye bye. <laughs> Radically, lovingly say no more. That's not who I am. Find that naked courage to rediscover who you really are and to ditch the hijacker. With love, with gratitude, but not with continuing to enable it, not with complacency, not with giving into it, not with believing in what it says. I mean, courage is the ability to not believe in your own thinking process, to know that you're more than your thoughts. And then exposure becomes less dangerous because you know it's not you that gets exposed, it's the guy in the back of the seat. It's not me. Oh, I've never <laughs> manipulated. I've never controlled. I've never been false. I've never wanted these false things. I've never wanted safety and security in distorted ways. I've always been pure and free, but I believed I was this voice that is observable. Therefore, how can I be it? So stop believing in it. The real way to believe in yourself is to stop believing in yourself. Stop believing in everything you think is you. That's true faith in yourself. True courage, naked being. Let what come, come. Let what goes, go. And uh, let it burn up in the clarity of consciousness. Be free. Free yourself from yourself. It's the biggest freedom. Because you're not this. You're not what you're defending. So, something like that. <laughs> what about any homework kick out the hitchhiker yeah mm -hmm. it's uh it's been a long ride it's been a long road trip with uh, a stranger in the back seat and you've adopted its toxic thoughts and life philosophy imagine at the age of five or six uh picking up this hitchhiker out of good intentions like oh maybe he can help me and i can help him and ever since you've been road tripping for like 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, you've been road tripping with this stranger in the back. But then he's no longer a stranger, is he? In fact, if it's just you and the hitchhiker for 60 years in the car, is it going to feel like you're married? It's going to feel like it's exactly who you are. There's going to be no distinction in your sense of self between your true sense of self and the false sense of self. So now you've become one with the toxic thoughts. You've accepted them all as if they are your free will. They've never been your free will because it's never been your soul's priority to be safe, secure, protected, uh, well, uh, having acquired lots of things and success and status. That's never been your intention, ever. But you've adopted these things as a means to compensate for lack of courage. What's courage? The faith that you are free from anything that's observable, including your own thoughts. When you gain that faith, you'll gain the courage to act on that faith. And then exposing yourself doesn't make much of a difference anymore. In fact, it helps you remove the Band-Aid, this toxic Band-Aid that just keeps the wound festering. Take it off and you'll heal very quickly. But you got to be willing to not believe in yourself. And that takes faith in yourself. Mm. Beautiful. Yeah, so that's the homework. I mean, do it as you please. Yeah. But it's just a radical decision of self-honesty, realizing how you've been full of shit, like a hundred thousand different ways every day how you've manipulated everything, how you've tried to control everything, and just see that that's never really been you. That'd be the homework. And then you find a lot of your afflictive states will disappear as well, if not all of them. Because part of the voice in that, in the back of your seat, in the back of your mind, that false sense of me, is continuously suggesting that you're lacking things, that you're not worthy, that you're not good enough, that you're not perfect yet, that... Um, you don't deserve love, that you can die, that you can lose somebody, that you can lack what you need. It's telling you all this stuff because it's the hitchhiker's own journey. It's not yours, but you've adopted it as truth because it's the only voice you've ever heard for like the past, for your adult life and longer. So find a way to uh, lovingly sever that connection with the toxic guest in the back of your mind. 
see that you're ready to let it go. And uh, the afflictive states will then also very quickly disappear. Because they're not part of who you are. They're false suggestions. Afflictive states are based in false suggestions. Made by the me you think you are on the back of the seat. But you're not. You're the driver. You're free from any hitchhikers. Cool. Any additions? Are we good? Wonderful. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you all. Thank you. And, uh, Thank you. Have a fabulous day. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Mirror Talks podcast with Bentinho Massaro. If you love these teachings and you want full access to almost all of Bentinho's recorded material, go to bentinomassaro.tv. Right now, we're offering a free seven-day trial with unlimited access to everything on bentinomassaro.tv, including curated playlists, guided meditations, and much more. This is our number one recommendation for you. As a subscriber, you'll get first access to these podcast episodes two weeks before they go public. You'll also get access to exclusive Q&As with Bentinho and other content only available to subscribers of BentinhoMassaro.tv. Also, Bentinho recently created a free online global enlightenment retreat. It's eight long form sessions that coherently guide you through the foundation of his enlightenment teachings. You can watch the free online global enlightenment retreat at BentinhoMassaro.tv or on YouTube. If you're interested in the most current and complete overview of Bentinho's work to date, this is where we recommend you start. Another great resource is Trinfinity Academy, Bentinho's free online school for enlightenment, empowerment, and infinity. Each class is concise and clear and distills one key topic at a time, including homework. We strongly recommend you check out Trinfinity Academy if you want to master the mechanics of Bentinho's teachings. Finally, don't underestimate the value of sharing this episode with the people who came to mind as you were watching or listening. It's a service to them and the collective, and it's also the best thing you can do to support us in getting this message far and wide. We also encourage you to like, subscribe, and leave positive reviews and ratings on your preferred platforms, and follow Bentinho on social media, especially Instagram. Thank you 